personal favor if you would silence your cellular phones and also not take pictures or video during this show. Um, you guys know that Summer Arts has the greatest artists in the world, incredible, wonderful, generous people who come here and teach our students. But more importantly than that, Summer Arts has the greatest students in the world. So tonight, I'm actually here to introduce you to two of our students, although chances are that you probably know them, um, because these two wonderful ladies embody everything that is great about summer arts. They have an interdisciplinary spirit, they collaborate with other classes, they embrace everything that summer arts has to offer, they get around, they meet people that make themselves available for collaboration and conversation. Um, I love them. Summer Craft and Sage Curtis. Hi, I'm Sage Curtis, and I'm Summer Craft. We are repeat students here who have the great honor of introducing to you Kimberly Dark and Lydia Yuknovich tonight um, for their reading at the last public event of this year's Summer Arts. We were first fortunate enough to work with them in memoir writing in 2013, and then last year also in memoir writing, and this year in essay writing. I still have the poster from their last reading that I stole off the wall in the library hanging up in my bedroom. It reads sex and memoir in big pink letters. Tonight they will be reading together again. Kimberly Dark is not only a talented storyteller, social activist, and writer, she is also one of the greatest teachers. Last year, Kimberly, Kimberly kicked off our member war course with words that have since become my art and life mantra, do no harm and take no shit. Her skill at bringing together talented, inspirational, enthusiastic people does not end with the guest artists, although they are clearly amazing also. Our courses at Summer Arts have changed my life just from the exposure to so many diverse voices and stories. At the end of each year, she asks us to reflect, and the best summary of a Kimberly course came out of that activity. It's like AA, but for writers. <laughs> Lydia Yukonovich often refers to making a puddle in her seat when she gets excited about something, <laughs> or going a little deaf when she's in a room with someone she admires, and that seems to be how nearly everyone who meets Lydia feels about her. Firstly, because of her generosity as an artist and a human, always listening to anyone who speaks, intently and presently, I have seen very few people practice presence like she does. And secondly, as a teacher, and her generosity and specificity there. She was the first person who told me that my story mattered, and her permission broke open my voice. Her memoir, The Chronology of Water, was the first book that truly, beautifully shattered me. There are few voices I value in the world of social action, literature, and experimental writing that marries the personal and the political like I do hers. Without further ado, please welcome Kimberly Dark and Lydia Yuknovich. is laced with lovely biking and walking paths. Through farms and along the canals, they connect tiny towns and larger roadways. Sometimes I am alone on the path, flanked only by cows and goats, sheep and geese. On Sunday afternoons, the bike and foot traffic is persistent. On Wednesday, I was ambling along silent, noticing the slight greening of a field that was turned just a few days back. Geese flew up from the canal as the barge went by, and then a man on a bicycle approached from behind and slowed to speak to me. 
I smiled. I shook my head. Being a visitor, I told him in English, I don't speak Flemish. Now, in an instant, I knew it. He wasn't just pausing to ask directions or tell me something about the town or bridge ahead or that I'd dropped my notebook from my bag. He was giving me the look, chin jutting slightly, eyes taking in an untoward amount of me, given that we didn't know one another. Now, a person could imagine a leer, a tone of voice, especially without benefit of language, were these looks and comments, stops and demands for attention, not persistent in a person's life in a woman's life, in my life. Now, I am nearly 50 years old. I mean, how many times in my life has this scene occurred? No way to count, because we learn early to dismiss these moments as part of the landscape, nothing worth noting, but for noting silently what we are wearing, who is around, how we could have put ourselves in danger, and what we might have done to invoke such attention. These are the moments when the mind reviews the familiar landscape of self-blame. The body tightens slightly, ready for the kind of intrusion, maybe harm, which feels inevitable, if not deserved. This is how the story went. A foreign film without subtitles, yet the meaning will remain clear. He spoke to me, and I smiled and nodded, and then he spoke again, riding slow just ahead of my walking, then crossing back and forth ahead of me to slow his ride, but also block my path. I kept my pace and smiled, and then his face grew irritated at my lack of verbal response. Oh, middle-aged white man, bad teeth, wearing farmer's clothes, these details make him merely Flemish on a country road. No more. He could have been a man of any appearance. And so I spoke to reroute his irritation. I said, I don't speak Flemish. And perhaps he asked where I'm from. I said, I speak English. And German smiled and shrugged at his further talking. Perhaps to him, it seemed that I was inviting conversation, which I really didn't mean to do. But this is a bind, isn't it? No way to avoid hostility without seeming to invite something. He spoke, he slowed, and seemed to ask me to slow down too, but I did not. And maybe he was speaking German, but with such a strong accent I couldn't understand, or maybe my mind couldn't multitask the understanding of an accent in foreign language with the other task it had just been given. You know, it's that thing we do, assess the surroundings. Instead of seeing greening fields, fluffy sheep, I considered the landscape for exits. Field, canal, path. For human company, none visible in either direction, perhaps a kilometer all around. For his stature, could I take him? I'm big, but never sure, especially as I age. He was speaking louder, and then coaxing me to stop and move off the path with him. He rolled ahead and tried again for me to stop, which I did not. Smiling, I gestured toward the town as destination never slowed down. He rode on beside me still, and there he was. I saw the turning moment, as I have so oft before, where my management of our interaction is vital. His irritation, small twitch, set jaw. He reasserted his desire that I stop my transit, and though I had been shaking my head already, I added the words in English, then in German, and I was speaking through my smile. I thought to add in French as well, je dis que non, I have said no. In three languages now, I said it, still smiling, walking, looking toward the town, which could not be seen, but best we both imagine it. He rode beside me, and then, Disgusted, shook his head, gestured me off, and rode on. Now, a few years ago, I was invited to offer storytelling as a keynote for an obesity research conference in Canada. My storytelling performances about bodies and culture, about gender, race, sexuality, size, they're invited to conferences sometimes as a way to explore a theme in a different format. It's a way to connect participants' thinking feeling selves. Now the invitation itself was not unusual, but the audience was. 
So when I had the organizer on the phone, I said, hey, you know, thanks so much for inviting me, but I'm curious. I mean, how did the committee choose me? I mean, I'm not usually invited to events that use the term obesity. I find that language pathologizing to fat bodies. Usually my views aren't welcome at conferences like this. See, I prefer fat as a neutral descriptive adjective in defiance to its cultural non-neutrality. Much as one might use tall or blonde or deaf to describe a person, though I expressed curiosity about my inclusion, I was indeed pleased to reach a group who would likely have never considered my perspectives before. The organizer confirmed that, indeed, not everyone was pleased to have me in his keynote, but that a small group of qualitative researchers on the organizing committee felt it was important to invite me. A few medical professionals already intended to boycott my presentation. The organizer said part of the reason they invited me in particular was that they wanted to gently persuade their colleagues that they should care about that stigma. They should care about the perspectives of the people with whom they work. I don't know how to say this, she stammered, but you're nice. You're likable. I nodded silently on the phone as she spoke, understanding immediately. Her committee found my themes valuable, my analysis solid, and still, I'm funny and entertaining and know how to handle an audience. Nice. <laughs> Being nice is a performative choice. There is an art to smiling and subtly engaging bullies without agreeing with them. Though there's always a danger that kindness will be read as capitulation. Now, being nice does not mean that I am not angry or frustrated or frightened or sad or anxious. It means that I am calling upon a demeanor that works certain situation. It can be an unconscious response, of course, a habituated response to specific people or stimuli. You know, some women, once they shake off the learned response of niceness toward bullies, they cannot reclaim it as a performative choice. Fair enough. And I am mostly not unconscious about being nice, which does not make it an act. Niceness is not merely gendered weakness. Niceness is complex. As I was walking downtown in Hilo, Hawaii recently, two brown-skinned men, probably in their 30s, perhaps part Polynesian, stopped in the street to comically appreciate me. They didn't try to lure me off the path, and yet they were in my way, performing flattery to bring me pleasure and cause me to appreciate them in return. Their words and actions seemed more an act of bonding between the two of them than a way to manipulate my behavior. One leapt dramatically in front of me, legs spread, arms wide, a choo choo, while leering at me, head dramatically moving up and down to take in my body. His friend smiled and joined him, saying, Oh, you're looking good, ma'am, similarly leering. I shook my head and chuckled, walking past. The humor in that encounter came in part from their language choice, acknowledging that I am older than they. And their clowning was silly, midday in a well-populated area. Now, have you all wondered yet what I was wearing in either of these street harassment examples? Hmm. Just note that you have already formed an opinion on what my current appearance means. Okay, one more example, though, in which I do not perform only niceness, I offer irritation and correction as well. The farmer's market, it's half a mile from my home. I'll tell this story in the present tense because even though these are remembered incidents, they're happening now to someone. They will happen through the night and all day tomorrow. Around the world, they will continue happening. As I leave the market, on foot, with my bag of vegetables, a man, perhaps in his late 20s, walks next to me, a few feet away. 
He seems stoned. He's giving me the look. He's keeping pace with me, begins talking, mumbling, gesturing with his chin toward my body, my face as he speaks. It goes something like this. Mumble, mumble, hot, sexy, mumble, slurp, like to get a taste, mumble, mumble. <laughs> and I pause and say, excuse me? I can't hear what you're saying. Are you speaking to me? He nods and leers and walks beside me yet apart from parking lot to road and one more time he says, mumble, mumble, like to let me mumble, slurp, mumble. <laughs> and he gestures toward his car, opens his arms and smiles to indicate my bountiful size and tastiness with a small pelvic twitch. I put up a hand and say, no. And if you have something to say to somebody, speak up and say it. I am irritated to be waylaid. I'm wearing sandals and sundress, uncombed hair, previously unconscious of my appearance as I left the house. And even now, I would rather be thinking of what I am making for lunch. I'm not working today. I don't want to be nice. And this feels selfish, too. This is not nothing. I've taken a day off from managing this behavior, but he has not taken a day off from pursuit. I feel pressed into service and the beats bound for juicing are heavy in my bag. Then his car is beside me, riding slow. He persists, mumbling and slurping like a hungry fool, and I say, please go away. And he leaves, but circles around and back again. I am about a block from my home. I think, Oh, hell no, you are not following me home. We are in my neighborhood. Or perhaps it is the absurdity of his age and approach that raise my ire. I perceive him as a child who requires correction, and so I stop, irritated and parental, to speak to him through the open passenger side window. A few feet from the car, speaking loudly enough for him to hear me clearly, I say, okay, look, what you are doing here is creepy. You're actually following me home, and I am not having that. I am on foot. You are in a car. Creepy! If you want to ask somebody for sex, ask somebody who looks like they want sex, not somebody buying groceries. <laughs> and ask in a tone of voice and a volume that can be heard. And you know what? If a person is not interested in your advances, then go away. <laughs> I am in full oratory now. And he is still leering and gesturing with his chin. And then slowly, he begins to look more at his lap. And look, I say, somebody needs to tell you this because I don't know why. Maybe you're too young to know better and I am old enough to be your mother. In fact, who is your mother? Do you live around here? Does your family live near here? I mean, we live in a small community and what you are doing here is creepy. <laughs> To which he said, chin on chest, I'm sorry, ma'am, and drove away. <laughs> I called after his car, that's better! And I carried my groceries home. Now, in my youth, before I knew better, I accepted my mother's admonition that I dressed too provocatively. I accepted friends' and teachers' assessments that I was cultivating an outlandish look that would draw weirdos. As a teenager, I'd shake my head and say, oh, yeah, I'm a weirdo magnet. Maybe it's because of how I look. The term weirdos may be appropriate to describe men who feel the need to gawk and talk and threaten and compliment and proposition and divert my time and energy. It's weird, though common, but this language conceals important things. Gender, habituated gendered behavior, male bonding rituals, gender socialization. It's not that I attract weirdos. It's not even that I attract men. It's that often, really often, men feel entitled to objectify, belittle, harass, flirt with, talk to, proposition, and bully any woman they choose. You know, what you're talking about, it doesn't happen to all women. My girlfriend said one day as I rehearsed a story for a reading about street harassment. See, she's a bit older than me and could only recall a handful of times that she had ever been catcalled in her whole life. 
She said she liked it. It made her feel like part of a group of women to which she didn't always feel she belonged. I looked her up and down, you know, trying to put on the male gaze. You're scary, I concluded. She's six foot two, she wears men's clothes, and if she's in a bad humor or simply walking alone, she looks like she could kick your ass and not be sorry. I love some of those things about her. She doesn't always read like a woman or a target. She doesn't always receive the behavior. Now me, I don't fight, I don't run, I've never been particularly fast or extra strong, and just like my girlfriend, sometimes I enjoyed street harassment as a young person because my culture taught me that fat girls would never get love. And something about street harassment feels like the precursor to love, attention. You know, if you're invisible, how will you ever get love? I mean, this is what we manage along with social expectations on the street. How can I keep the attention I think I need and direct it, not get hurt or used? It's up to me to attract it and deflect it and incite men to be wonderfully wild, yet prevent them from being savage. I am the conductor of an entire cultural orchestra of gendered behavior. That's what I learned. Even at age 11, when my body turned from child to fireworks, I was supposed to be an expert conductor of male behavior. That's what we all learned. If you're invisible, how will you ever get anything? I mean, just as fat girls are taught to be grateful for any attention we get, all women are taught that rallying male attention is important to basic survival. This is not an overt lesson. Ubiquitous nonetheless. So we cultivate the right kinds of visibility. Men and women live separate lives after all. Sure, we often live in the same houses, always in the same towns. We make and parent children, and most of us come from two gender households. Men and women live separate lives. Many still find cross-gender friendships odd and traditionally, which means even so today, when women are going about their own business, they are working in jobs, they are raising children, cooking meals, cleaning, socializing, primarily with other women, teaching, making things, and so on. Traditionally, when men are going about their own business, they are working in jobs, also working in government in medicine, in city infrastructure, in religion, socializing primarily with other men, teaching, watching, and playing sports. We are not always involved in the same pursuits. And how dramatically do the impacts of our pursuits differ? The orchestration of male attention, often male permission, is not incidental to women's lives. Not on the street, not anywhere. Now, when I considered, when I finished my talk at that obesity researchers conference, a few of the medical doctors, less so the lab researchers, seemed stunned by my very existence. It was as if they had never allowed for a fat woman to be interesting and complex, able to discuss matters of importance, able to enjoy her body, consciously name and combat stigma. I mean, women, fat people, people of color, all who endure stigma are supposed to remain silent about it after all. That's the value in teaching us to blame ourselves for being bullied. We don't speak up for fear of shame and potential ridicule. It was as though I was an apparition to him, an anomaly, and so with the entitlement you'd expect, one by one, the handful of men, they were men, approached me to take a medical history. Well, that's what they do, isn't it? They ask me about whether I have diabetes, whether I have high cholesterol, in which BMI category did I reside? Obesity 3, it looks like to me, probably, would that be right? One man, after our talk regarding my health, used this language. Wow, wow, so yeah, you're valid. I mean, I would consider you valid. 
You're a healthy person. Wow. <laughs> Mind you, I was not speaking on anything related to medical care, nor had I once mentioned my health or lack thereof. But this seemed to be the only context in which he could render me legible. I was speaking on stigma, on how certain bodies are socially sanctioned and how you can't separate the effects of fat in the body from the effects of being fat in the culture. Now the latter, it causes pain and lack of opportunity. It impedes credibility and compromises health. He could not hear what I said until he had judged me physically valid. And he was astonished to be able to make such a pronouncement. He's not alone. People often don't act with others, interact with others outside of their social stereotypes. And that is why simple conversation plus time getting to know one another is still the most radical tool for humanizing others that we know. And how often does that happen? Casually, between men and women who are not contemplating romantic standing in a conference hall next to a table full of coffee and napkins, I responded to that doctor's questions with patience. I was at work. My body was public. He had something to learn, and I was on the job. The problem is, all women's bodies are treated as public bodies. Men have something to learn about how to interact respectfully. And those who don't think they have something to learn should be actively teaching other men the error of their ways when they see them. If they're not, they still have something to learn about social responsibility. I'm good at this job. I tap into a well of compassion for others. I'm nice. I turn a phrase that can open dialogue. Not everyone will do that, nor should they. Sometimes I need a day off, but I choose this work. Those who don't choose it should be left to their own lives and able to create lives that don't require male attention and permission. They need many days off from helping men understand that they are behaving poorly. And they certainly need safety and respect and the credibility of being humans with experiences and expertise about the world. Just recently, on that canal path in East Flanders, some guy felt entitled to order me to stop what I was doing, get off the path, and interact with him. Consider the vile absurdity of this. I mean, at what point would it ever be a good idea for a woman to stop with an unknown and overbearing man, especially one who didn't speak her language, and follow him off the path into the trees? And there is nothing but nothing in this charming Flemish countryside to suggest bad neighborhood or troubled surroundings. And likely those who know that man who menaced me would call him friend or neighbor, a nice guy, a regular guy. That's just it, a regular guy. We are all somewhere on the road either moving toward or away from systemic misogyny. No one is standing still. Those through stories and movement and language and how we assert our human dignity, we are creating culture. I know which way I'm going on that road. And for anyone moving toward more conscious interactions, I'll do my best to offer you kindness. Mothers and Misfires. 
My father died courteously a few years ago. My mother won't be so easy. She's losing her memory. She spent all of her money. She's in great physical health, and she just moved into my house last month. She seems to believe that most things are either my fault for nagging her too much, or they are Barack Obama's fault. Now, this is in part because she says he's a black Muslim Democrat, the worst of each of those things. What happens when the mind begins to misfire and then a relationship begins to misfire? Rewind. What happens when a relationship misfires and then the mind misfires and playback? Misfires create misfires, create minds. Forward. Where do we go from here? Grief washes over me like a storm, like an inconvenience, sometimes like a light summer rain. Grief suddenly raises the level of everything that isn't nailed down, and I gasp for air, trying to not get clocked by the armor floating by. Grief undoes the buttons on my blouse and nurses like a horrible wailing baby giant over mother child. Where am I? Under the water or above it? Is this a metaphor or genuine peril? Am I leaving the light on for my child or my mother or myself? I'm afraid of the dark. Maybe we all are. I admit it, I'm afraid. We could all be electrocuted the way I worry the light switch and all this wetness and grief. The other day, having light conversation with my friend and mother, I made a joke about my friend having done something silly. She said to my mother with clear sarcasm, Kimberly's mean. My mother, in seriousness, with a look of painful resignation on her face, said, I know. She does not see what I did to love and protect her. She only sees what I did to save myself from her never-ending, insatiable. During my early 20s, I participated in a weekly peer-facilitated support group for women survivors of sexual abuse and assault. Most of us had survived incest in addition to whatever else. And sure, we sometimes spoke about our fathers and stepfathers and our mother's boyfriends, uncles, grandfathers. These were the vast majority of abusers. Sometimes we spoke about them, but mostly we talked about our mothers. I mean, father is a puzzle, no doubt. It's a puzzle that is sometimes simple, sometimes complex, but all the pieces are in the box. I mean, there is no nefarious rigging of the game, and if you lose a piece, you can just look for it. I mean, father is everywhere and everything. Patriarchy has made father visible. You can try to get a job, use language, have sex, open a pickle jar. Here's a piece of the puzzle everywhere you look. The puzzle can be solved. Mother. Mother is like trying to sculpt fog into usable tools. Even when everything looks right, it doesn't quite work. Everything can dissipate, disappear, or rearrange, leaving me wondering if it was all real. I mean, have you lost your mind? Created imaginings? That's how Mother is, well, at least for me. And what happens when I can't see her anymore? People get old and die, one day turns to the next. The younger are likely to outlive the older. I'm grateful that I know when to cry and just wait for the next good thing to come. Even when it's not clear that something good is coming, something good is always coming. Now, the best feeling I ever had was right after giving birth. I mean, relief of pain, it's a phenomenal high. I didn't understand that something could hurt so badly. I mean, I just didn't understand it. I thought childbirth was natural, and because everybody's mother did it, it couldn't be that big a deal. And then I realized that those Lamaze classes, they were just keeping me distracted and cheerful about the pending disaster, <laughs> about the earthquake that would whip through my body, turning my bones into tectonic plates that would lurch apart, crash together, tear the soil of me, and cause the insides to erupt out. I mean, I didn't know how profoundly the body could take over. You know, I've 
always been a life of the mind kind of gal. I mean, I've always relied on the body for pleasure. Okay, okay, I've known pain in the body and disappointment, but wow, <laughs> pleasure. Always and soon, pleasure. With the birth too, pleasure came when the pain ended. There was so much pain in the core of my body that somebody could have walked in and ripped off my arm and I wouldn't have noticed. I kicked a nurse who tried to examine me and no one would peg me for a nurse kicker. I mean, the earth of my body was rending and she was simply in the way. Trying to put her hand in my vagina to feel the baby's head was profoundly not the right thing for that nurse to do. Pop, right off the end of the bed she went. I cried and wailed and felt sure I couldn't push the baby out. But I wasn't the one doing the birthing. My body was becoming an exit wound. My son arrived and the doctor lifted his tight little quaking body. The first thing we saw was a stream of urine fountaining from his baby penis. His father, standing by for the magical moment, wept and said, Oh, he's peeing on you. And I held him briefly, and his father held him briefly. And that's when the rush came. <laughs> a sense of relief from pain that made me feel all powerful. A sense of relief from pain that made me feel like my body was indeed a planet capable of opening and emitting life and hurtling through space with whole moons in its orbit. Of course, that feeling was fleeting. I soon slept mightily, no one able to wake me after what had been a two and a half day labor. Sleep was too good. Something good is always coming. And then again, something worse. We spoke of our mothers, mostly. I mean, what could be said about the men who abused us as children? We asked each other questions uh, that our mothers couldn't answer. Why did she need me so much? Why did she turn away and tell herself she didn't know? Why did she send him in? Why did she expect me to fix everything, solve everything? Why did she seem so fragile? How could she look at me with such disgust? How could she see me as such a failure? We talked about our mothers. Now, I did not let myself know at first that something in my, mind, my mother's mind was misfiring. My mother has always been cryptic to me, difficult to grasp, harder to hold. After she spent three days visiting my son's small apartment, seeing the sights in his university town, he called to ask me, Mom, what are you going to do about Grandma? What do you mean, do about her? I asked, incredulous. She's losing her mind, he shouted into the phone. And then he recounted her various mental misfires not remembering what she ordered in the restaurant, not knowing where she put things in her suitcase, constantly looking for what she had just set down. And the most disturbing, he said, sometimes it's like she doesn't even know who you are. I'm her only child, and she doesn't know who I am. Sometimes, he said, she seemed to think that he was her son and that I was... No one. Yes, I confirmed to him. I had noticed this behavior. Some part of me must have thought it was endemic to our relationship. In the fog of her waking dream, I sometimes recede inexplicably. I'm not visible, not part of the story, not evident in the landscape, and then I return again. As irritating, startling, and improbable, as Barack Obama in the White House. She says she wouldn't be losing it if everything weren't so difficult. What am I going to do about her? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know how this story ends, so I'll just make it up. I'll tell you a mythology that implicates you as well, because, whoa, we are all born and enough of them have given good fearlessly that healing the lovelessness of my particular mother or yours or me or our children, this should be easy. We will reach back through time and through our mother's sadnesses and traumas and broken skin and missed expectations 
We will help every angry girl woman grow up into a whole woman who does her best. We will say, let your insatiability rest. Be whole and full and comfortable. We will do this. And in reaching back, we will feel them reaching forward through us as they always have been, waiting for a hand to grasp. We will give them our hands and build a monument together from all the good deeds of mothers through time. We will tell them we're sorry for what happened to them as children, as women. We will absolve them of wrongdoing and tell them that they are loved. That's my story how this ends. I will care for my mother's body as long as she's in it, perhaps not as she would most want me to, and I will do it just the same. I will feel both loss and relief when she leaves that body. There have been many misfires, and now, I mean, what could that possibly mean to me now? For her sake and for mine, I will take care of my body and myself by doing my best. Reaching back through time and death, I will pull us forward, light all of the circuits at once, so that the thing I bury eventually will be our shame. Thanks, folks. I'm going to introduce the fabulous. struggle, the same frustrations, and there's no higher person or lower person. And so I want you to understand, I'm here for you. I came here for you. So thank you for sharing your work with me. This is a narrative braid. Remember? <laughs> this is one. And you'll hear it. You'll hear it. The piece is called Woven. Find it at the magazine online Guernica, which I highly recommend you submit to. I can't remember the name of the bar, but I remember I was 22 and I was having the time of my life on Halloween night with my then girlfriend in Greenwich Village. At 22, we could drink like beautiful, androgynous, unafraid fish, young badass women in love, in love, in love, in the bohemian capital of the world. Or that's how it felt to me anyway. She was a student at New York University, and I wasn't anything, having flunked out of college three times. We had plans that spanned continents. Youth foreshortens everything. Faces. Lives. Partway through a shit ton of cheap vodka shots, she got up on our rickety little wooden bar table and danced. And when I say she danced, I mean she punched the air like a boxer. So I climbed up on my chair and danced, kind of like that, just underneath her, because I was inspired by this woman. And she started laughing uncontrollably, pointing, pointing at my midsection, because my skirt was tucked up into my neon blue tights enough that my neon blue butt was showing. 
I guess I'd made some kind of bathroom miscalculation last time I was there. And we laugh, that kind of deep-throated, about-to-be-women laugh. The laugh of girls before their voices thin out and tighten from the exhaustion of woman. In fact, and it's only because I'm old and no longer give a shit, I can tell you this, I laughed so hard I made a little unstoppable poop in those neon lights, <laughs> like a perfectly round deer turd. It was a night I never wanted to end. Or I wish with all my heart that the story ended there, mythic youth, but that's not where the story ended. When I was four years old, my Lithuanian grandmother told me a folktale about the water spirit Launi. I'd accidentally locked myself in my grandparents' bathroom and got into hysterics when I couldn't get out. My father was furious at my ineptitude. His yelling nearly broke down the door. But this, this is the story she told me once I was liberated. Laumes came from transcendental waters, and her spirit lives in all waters, even baths and showers and rivers and streams and oceans and the rain and even in toilets. She's the guardian of all children, the not yet born, the newly born, the orphan, the forgotten, even the dead children. If there's a child coming into the world, she can foresee it. If a child is mistreated, she will sometimes take him and raise him herself. If a child is lost, she protects him. Laume rewards those who work hard, especially mothers. She also punishes severely those who seek reward without any attention to hard work, or those who pursue self-aggrandizement. Go look underneath your pillow to see if she has left you a treasure. I walked upstairs to the bedroom. My whole body shook. I stood in the bedroom a long minute with my eyes closed, waiting for hands on my shoulders. I looked around for my father there in the dark, because that's the life I had, a father there in the dark, but he wasn't anywhere. I looked underneath my pillow. There was a star woven from straw about the size of my hand. One of the most famous Laumes was a fisherman's daughter, Egle, queen of the serpents. One day, Igla finds a large eel in her clothes after swimming in the Baltic Sea, and the eel takes her clothing and only returns it when she promises to marry him. When she accepts, the eel becomes a handsome young man named Zilvanus, and they live underwater together and have three children, two sons and a daughter. And after a time, Igla longs to visit her parents and siblings on land, and Zilvanus is terrified that Igla's former family will reject her but he agrees to let her go and bring their children. He instructs Egler to call to him, if you are alive and well, come back to me in a milky wave in the water, and if you are dead or harmed in a bloody wave. When she arrives to visit her earthly family, Egla's brothers, jealous of her freedom, torture her sons to death. Her daughter, smitten with one of the earth brothers, betrays the secret call and lures Zilvanus to shore, where he is murdered. When Egla returns to the lip of the water, she sees a bloody wave and learns that her earth brothers have betrayed her. She curses herself and her daughter, turning them into trees forever. Many infant girls in Lithuania still carry the names of trees. In the ninth year of our 11-year marriage, my second husband emerged from our kitchen pointing a gun at me. I haven't written much about this, at least not literally. I don't really like to talk about it. It's a bit like a little malformed myth still lodged between my heart and my ribcage. In America, it's tricky to describe violence without it turning into entertainment. A Sig Sauer P229 9mm handgun. Statistically, the most popular handgun in the United States. I just entered the house after work. The kitchen light was on, but not the living room light, so he was backlit. The whole house smelled like Jameson's. I stood in the dark. My car keys were still in my hand. He crossed the space between us, and when he was maybe three feet away, he stopped. The gun was pointed at my chest, the air in my lungs concrete. I walked the rest of the distance between us until the gun was between my breasts. That's how I know he was crying. 
I stared at my second husband. Nothing moved in the house except our breathing. Stop loving me, he finally said, the gun heavy enough for me to feel my sternum ache, as if love was killing him. Stop loving me. No, I said, and pulled and pulled myself into him and closed my eyes and put my arms around him and pressed and pressed, and I waited for the possible death moment between a man and a woman. Walking straight into violence wasn't new to me. I'd learned how to walk deliberately into violence from my father, like so many other children do in this country. In fact, in this country, we raise our children on one form of violence or another. And so my question is not, why did you walk into that violence? My question is, where does my love come from that I walk through male violence to find it? Laumes are the oldest spirits in Lithuanian mythology. They first appeared in the form of animals like goats, bears, or mares. Later, they took on half-human appearance and usually had bird claws for feet and the lower body of a she-goat and large stone nipples. Later, she was represented as a beautiful and supernatural water woman creature with fair hair and skin the color of the moon. Laumes were both benevolent and dangerous. They could tickle men to death and then eat their bodies. They could protect women and children or punish them brutally. Anyone who knows me knows why I'm attracted to Laomes. I am a child of the waters. But then, so are all of us before the breach. I had a recurring dream for 20 years that I would have three beautiful sons. I did not have three sons, and I'm 50 fucking three, so it's not looking likely. <laughs> what I did have was a daughter who died, and one son, son of my life. But I did have three husbands, and three long-term relationships with women. Maybe dreams don't mean a goddamn thing. Or maybe they mean everything. They say the that you marry a man who is like your father. My father, the artist turned architect, molested and abused us. He was big and angry and loud fisted, marked us forever, three little women making for their lives. My first husband, therefore, was gentle as a beautiful swan, a painter with long fingers and eyelashes. He was so beautiful, he was woman like. He could see what I was shooting for. <laughs> but I was me. So I almost self-immolated next to his passive beauty. My second husband, another painter, <laughs> used harsh lashing strokes on the canvas, and he was big and loud, but made softer by alcohol and art. Except when he wasn't the gun of him, six sour. My third husband, father of my now son, is big and loud, but he's a filmmaker. <laughs> There's a gentleness of a cellist in his hands and eyes. So sometimes I wonder if my dream wasn't meant to show me three sons, but these three husbands. Take my second husband, for instance, the one who pressed the gun of him to me. He was a hell of a lot like a child. So I wonder if Laume came and took my baby daughter, who died right before I met him, and replaced her with a man-child. This is kind of how we get through our lives, isn't it? We tell ourselves stories so that what's happening becomes something we can actually live with. Necessary fictions. Maybe I had some hard lessons to learn about the difference between doing good work and trying too hard to be a woman. Woman. Like anyone even knows what the hell that is. Still. Or violence. Maybe this is a story about violence. Or maybe I'm still looking for a way to forgive myself for that failure of womanhood. Two marriages gone bust, oh Jesus, woman, what the hell? I keep waiting to feel like the failure. I wonder what would happen if I didn't know what this story was about. I think it might be a children's story. 
It is said that Laomi was a silken-haired sky goddess who lived in the clouds, and one myth claims that she fell in love with a beautiful young man down on earth, and they had a son, and Laomi descended to earth from the sky to feed her son with their breasts. But when the highest god found out about the son and the sacrilegious love, he killed the boy and scattered his remains between the stars and the sky, and he cut Laomi's breasts. Stone pieces of them can still be found on earth in the form of sea creature fossils. You find one, it's a breast. You would not believe how many fucking sea creature fossils live at my house. I'm going to try again. When I was 22, I spent Halloween night in Greenwich Village. I drank vodka in a Russian bar with my girlfriend at the time. A huge middle-aged Russian man and his male friend said, drunk, fat Russian things to us all night, not a word of which we understood. And we laughed, and they laughed, and we toasted, and things seemed strangely okay, like when you were young and drunk. And I kept yelling, I'm Lithuanian, to the Russian man, like that was something. Later in life, I'd learn what a spastic thing that was to be yelling to Russians. But at the time, it seemed like everyone, even the moon, was laughing and drunk. At midnight, a giant parade of Halloween costume people passed the bar, and so we joined them, and we walked for miles together. And there were animals like goats and bears and mares. There were bird claws for feet and the lower bodies of she-goats, and large extended tinfoil breasts and exaggerated cod pieces, and witches and fairies and mermaids. It was one of the happiest nights of my life. We were two girl women in love and love. We were walking with an army of people in Halloween costumes, more vivid and outrageous than reality would ever be again. Fear was nothing about us. Later, we found ourselves a few alleys away from her crappy dorm room, and we were stumble walking arm in arm, and we kissed and teetered along and laughed. And I put my hand up her shirt, and she put her hand down my pants, and then I saw her head lurch forward in a not right way. And she made a sound, or something did, like a pumpkin being smashed. Something hard at my back and then my side imploding. Two men had come up behind us, a one hit her in the skull with a baseball bat. And another stabbed me in the lower back and side with a knife. And my girlfriend dropped to her knees, her head hitting the pavement. And I saw her body perfectly balanced, head and knees keeping her perched, blood everywhere. I saw the two men laughing and yelling, and I saw their shaved heads, and I saw stars before I passed out. And the last thought I remember thinking was, skinheads? There is language enough to describe it, but going there is beyond language, so mostly I don't. I don't know how to belong to the story in a way that doesn't betray it. I don't even want to be in the story, the one in which a woman I loved, I loved, I loved, was left partially paralyzed. But mostly I don't want to tell this story because I didn't stay with her happily ever after. I've noticed the scar at my back and side has softened over the years. It's so tiny you can barely see it, receding with age and fat, I suppose, or the guilt of wanting more life. A woman was harvesting a flower bed and had taken her child with her. And she was so busy with her work that the child slept through the day. And when the woman went home in the evening to milk the cows and make dinner, she served her husband who asked her, where's my son? With terror, she whispered, I've forgotten him. And she ran as fast as she could to the place where she left her son. And she heard Laomi speak, hush, hush. The mother asked Laomi for her child back. And the fairy said, come, dear woman. Take your child, we've done nothing to him. We know how hard you work as a mother. You didn't mean to leave your child behind. And they went on to shower the babe with treasures, enough gifts to raise several children on. And the mother went home with her precious baby and with her gifts, and she was greeted with great joy. But another woman, hearing of the good fortune, was taken over by jealousy. She thought, I shall do the same as her, and I'll be showered with gifts. So the next evening at dusk, she took her child, and she just left him in the fields and went home. After dinner, she returned to the field, and she heard the Laomes, you left your child in greed. 
and the child screamed with great pain, for he was being pinched mercilessly, and the Laomes continued their torture until the mother approached, and then they tossed the child at her feet. The babe was dead. When my infant daughter died, spilling out of our shared waters, the story breached. Every story I've ever told has a kind of breach to it, I think. You could say that my writing isn't quite right, that all the beginnings already have endings in them. Violence, it doesn't only exist in men. Think of mother violence, for example. When my son was in grade school, I had hysterically violent thoughts. I was afraid he'd be bullied. He was tender-hearted, right? I actually pictured the moment. I saw myself stride across the school grounds, pick a bully child up by his ankles, hold him upside down, shake the fucking shit out of him, and fling him into a dumpster. <laughs> I fantasized all the way through, Mama has to go to jail, baby. <laughs> my Lithuanian grandmother cut the tip of my father's tongue as a boy for swearing. After I became a mother and married for the third time, I had a skinhead in my writing class. I know he was a skinhead, not from the way he looked, though that's exactly what he looked like, the 90s version of a London skinhead. I know he was a skinhead because he came to my office and told me. He asked not to ever have to do group work. And I'm sorry, I laughed when he said that, because it cracked me up. I also remember thinking, you are a brutal abomination. And not long ago, this guy was just a boy, just his mother's son. What the hell happened? His writing was impeccable. He completed every assignment. His theses were not Hitler-esque. He was oddly polite and courteous. I gave him a C minus only because I could, whether or not I should have. If he'd have challenged the grade, he'd have won. In many ways, he was the best writer in the class. So you tell me, what is a teacher? What is a mother? Another Laomé is a goddess of the home and warm heart. And if you do not tend to your family and fire well, she burns your whole house down with everyone inside. The word for fireplace in Lithuanian has come to be understood as family relations. In my 23rd year of teaching college, on a day we were discussing violence as a theme, something repressed inside me lurched, and I blurted out my Halloween night story to the entire class. I mean, I shot it out of my mouth before I could stop it, six hour like. I lifted up my shirt and showed him my scar. It was one of the more unprofessional teaching moments of my career, though it would certainly not be the last. <laughs> So much shame came out of my mouth. The shame of a daughter whose body was written by father. The shame of leaving a woman I loved, I loved, I loved. The shame of failed marriages and motherhoods. At the end of the story, I also told them what I'd learned about our attackers. They weren't skinheads. They'd been Marines. My then girlfriend would be neurologically damaged and partially paralyzed for the rest of her life. The Marines spent three months in jail. Everyone got quiet. I thought maybe the story was over, and my intention was to get us all out writing and out of the well of overly personal pathos I'd put us into. But then a Latino man in the class, his neck covered in tattoos, stood up. All I knew from his writing was that he'd been a gang member, that he'd made mistakes and gone to jail, that he was writing A-plus ideas with C-plus skills that his parents were undocumented workers, that he had four sisters, but I learned that day that he'd also been on three tours of duty for our country before he turned 22. I also learned that the military began relaxing tattoo restrictions in 2004. He stood up in the back of the class and said, I apologize on behalf of the Marines. His sentence was perfect. The air in the room vacuumed. And then he walked the length of the room straight at me. So I braced myself for the moment because I wasn't sure how much longer I could keep from crying. Briefly it occurred to me that I might die if he got any closer, closer than three feet away. 
And then he did a regular human thing. He hugged me. And he said it again, this time in my ear, and his breath made the hairs on my neck shoot up. I apologize on behalf of the Marines. But that's not what I heard. I heard, you don't have to punish yourself for love anymore. I didn't die like I thought I might from his random compassion. I mean, I wasn't a very good teacher. I don't know what the hell I was. I gave him an A in the class. <laughs> that day we wrote stories about the smaller violences in our daily lives. In one story, Lamai takes all the children away from their parents in a village because they sent their eldest sons to war. And the mothers become barren, and the fathers can no longer hold any food down, and thus the entire village dies. And the village fades from history because the parents didn't know how to take care of their children. You know, stories change, just like the lives we've lived and the selves we've inhabited. Nobody in the room has been the same person twice. I mean, really, it's the people walking around acting and sounding especially self-assured and whole who worry me the most. I like hearing the world's stories about itself. That's partly why I teach literature. It helps me feel less incarcerated by the world or my past or my mistakes and confusions. It helps me remember I'm not just American. I'm not just a woman, a mother, a teacher, a wife. I find value in storytelling. Aren't we all woven through with stories? Isn't that how we think of our lives, how we survive them? So now, when somebody hurts me, and they hurt me, I remember that they're only living the terms of their own fictions, sometimes desperately, so their selves don't unravel. I like that idea, a woven, person, little misshapen stars made of straw. So I'm going to read you two short, in case you're tired, <laughs> chapters. But I want you to ask me about this tomorrow when we see each other. Um, I'm no longer interested in the hard line between fiction and nonfiction at all. I'm not even sure I believe in it anymore. And so you can ask me about that. Or we could leg like, wrestle about it. <laughs> Please. <laughs> One chapter is the introduction of a character called The Writer. It begins with a quote from Virginia Woolf. You may have heard it before. A woman must have money in a room of her own if she's to write fiction. You read that essay? Yeah. What a crock. Virginia, fuck you, old girl, old dead girl. A woman must have money in a room of her own. Yeah, if somebody's taking care of her and the money comes from somewhere. Me? I'm in a midnight blue room, a writing room, a room of my own making with its rituals and sanctuary. I can see my husband and son in the next room fiddling with a video camera. Looking at them together makes my heart feel crushed like a wad of paper. I reach down below my desk and pull up a bottle of self, oops, I mean scotch, 
my scotch Belveni, 30 year. I pour myself a shot, I drink, warm lips, throat, I close my eyes. I am so not Virginia Woolf. <laughs> Do you know how many women can't afford the room or have no help or scratch, scratch away at things in bars and buses and closets? I much prefer a different line of yours, Virginia, old girl, if we're drinking together anyway. Arrange whatever pieces come your way. Or this one. Someone has to die in order for the rest of us to value life more. I know something about death. Inside everything I have ever written, there is a girl. Sometimes she is dead and haunts the story like a ghost. Sometimes she's an orphan of war. Sometimes she's just wandering. Maybe the girl is a metaphor. Or maybe the girl is me. Or maybe a character who keeps coming and coming. I write her and write her. Sometimes I think I'm following her into another place or self, and she's leading me, directing the traffic of my life. I've always been suspicious of narrators, and characters for that matter, of the figures of speech we create to stand in for people, ourselves. There's something weird and unnatural about them, how they do what we tell them, how they obey. I don't trust them. Narrators especially, chicken shits. I've been someone else hundreds of times. I've been a competitive swimmer for 18 years. I was a secretary in a lawyer's office for a year and a half. I was a waitress for eight days. I was a heroin addict for six years. I was married two times, 11 years first and now going on 18. I've slept with women for 20 years. I've slept with men all my life from the time I first remember things, if by sleeping with men one means sexual encounters with men and dicks. My father figures here. My mother's suicide attempts happened when I was 8, 18, and 28 before she got it right. I flunked out of college once, twice, bing, three times, then battled my way through to a PhD, became a teacher of literary things, whatever those things are. I've been drinking scotch for 26 years, off and on. I was incarcerated the first time as a minor for 18 months. I was incarcerated the second time of age for eight months. I was incarcerated the third time for eight nights. I was a mother the first time for nine months, just nine, then the mother of a dead daughter. Now I'm the mother of a son, strange, alive boy. I was depressed at age eight for one year, but it just felt like being on underwater, which was familiar to me, the swimmer, I was depressed the second time at age 11 for two years, and then again at 18 for one more, and then I went under depression, second self, and resurfaced violently, recurringly. Is that a life? Did you get all that? That list? Is that me? Is that a character? Is that a narrator? Everyone I love is an artist, and none of us know what we mean. Or we pretend that we do. Some of us win prizes and live strangely off the surface of things. Others of us toil away, making our own labor into an over-righteous romance. Some of us have jobs or tenure or family. Some of us are rich. Others ride the grant train. Some of us are homeless or nomads. Others addicts or recovering or lapsing. Aren't we all just shooting for life where art can matter? We make art, but in relation to what exactly? All the artists we admire from the past came out of the mouths of wars and crises, life and death. We come out of high capitalism, consumerist monsterhood. Even when our lives went to shit, they were still just our lives, our puny, overdramatic American lives. And where we're from, our so-called country, defined by the smell of a lot Blech. defined by the smell of a well-made latte, the silent hum of an all-consuming war machine, and the televised face of Oprah. Are we for something? Are we against it? Or have our battles become a show? All our artistic origins have been atomized, dead fathers and brave mothers against the kitsch and speed of this glossy, disposable new century. But I love it all. I write it all. Does love make art? What is the story of the self? What is chronology, the history of a life? Which story should I tell you to make this narrator, an American woman writer? Which plot, which pathos? Because any writer's life knots are embedded in whatever story they have to tell right then. I've invented hundreds of selves, 
men and women selves. I've peopled the entire corpus of my experience with fictions. Who is to say they are not I, I, them? And if I tell the truth just this once, will it be any different from all the other tellings? How? In what sense could it possibly matter? We are who we imagine we are. Every self is a novel in progress. Every novel is a lie that hides the self. This, reader, is a mother-daughter story. Hold that thought. I'm going to read you a tiny piece of chapter one. It's subtly called The Girl. <laughs> Just a piece of it. One winter night when she is no longer a child, the girl walks outside, her shoes against snow, her arms cradling a self, her back to a house not her own but somebody else's. It's a year after the blast that has atomized her entire family in front of her eyes. She's six. It's a house she's lived in with a widow woman who took her in, orphan of war, girl of nothingness. But that blast night has never left her. It's an unrelenting bruise. It's blue-black image purling in and out of memory forever. Nor will it ever leave her body, the blast forever injuring her spine a sliver of metal piercing flesh and entering her so that all her life she will carry the trace of that moment between vertebrae. Her mind moves to the moment of the blast, the singular fire lighting up the face of her father, her mother, first white, then yellow, then orange, then blue, then black, then nothing, her head swiveled by the force of the blow away from them. This doesn't frighten her. What used to be nightmares have transformed into color and light and composition and story. It's with her now, lifelong companion, still life of a dead family. The snow begs her senses now and she wishes she had a coat. She wishes she tied her shoes properly, worn proper socks, things a mother would tell you to do. The moon makes the entire setting for her motion lit up. She hears something, not her, and not the night, and not the white expanse waiting before her, and her feet are cold, and she can suddenly feel how numb her hands are shoved in her armpits, and she doesn't know what the noise is at first. It seems like a hummingbird's wings, but that's not possible. Then she hears it again, and she does know what it is. It's a wolf caught in a trap. She looks down near the fence line, and there it is, a wolf beyond beautiful with its leg caught in a trap. So she moves closer, aware now of how cold is biting her, and she studies the wolf. The wolf is smart. It's almost finished. She thinks only in the briefest of moments of releasing it, but doesn't. The wolf is nearly free. In its freedom, it will lose a leg, but it will be worth it. She holds perfectly still, more still than a dead person, which she has seen many times and more. And she watches the wolf chew its own leg by the light of the moon, by the rhythm of its journey. And the moon makes its slow arc in the sky, and inside the moon's movement, reflected in the girl's eyes, the wolf finally frees itself. It is then that she does something pure body, child-minded, she goes to where the rust orange and black metal of the trap sits holding its severed limb, to where blood and animal labor have reddened and dirtied the pristine white of the snow, like the violence against a canvas. And there, without thinking, she pulls down her pants, her underwear, squats with primal force and hisses and hisses where the crime happened. A steam cloud moves upward from the snow and the blood as the relief of rising heat warms her skin and her eyes close, and her mouth fills with spit, and everything is still. And this is how the sexuality of a girl is formed, an image at a time against white, taboo, thoughtless, corporeal.